leadership. Great. I am honored to be here with you today. When I was asked to talk to a group of mothers and teenage daughters, I was a little, little hesitant. I know what it's like to be a teen, teenage daughter, although the stories from my teenage years will not be told today. But I have no idea what it's like to be the mother of a teenage daughter, although I hear it's a lot of fun. So if I were you, what would I want to hear about? If I were a teenager, I would want to hear about the glamorous life of Blue Mercury. If I were a mom, I would want to see my resume and how I got there. And if my daughters were teenagers, which they will be someday, they're here in the audience, I would want them to hear the truth, that it takes dreams, hard work, and struggle to get there. Today, I want to give you a peek into Blue Mercury, tell you the story of the company's founding, and tell you my path there. Blue Mercury is the friendly neighborhood cosmetic store where you can get the most coveted beauty products in the world and get great tips and tricks about makeup and skin care. I have a great job. I get to pick makeup and skin care products that I want to sell. I get to meet with some of the world's greatest creative designers. I've had a little fun. There's Marc Jacobs up there with Daphne Guinness. I've been a reporter backstage at Fashion Week. I've met some famous people. This is in addition to doing the behind the scenes hard work, making sure we have enough money to pay our rent and our staff and buy merchandise. The best part, I get to do it all with my husband, who is also my best friend. This is the two of us at lunch in Leonard Lauder's apartment in New York City. The story of Blue Mercury's founding. I started Blue Mercury when I was 29 with my husband, Barry Beck. I graduated from business school and was working at a buyout fund. What's a buyout fund? We had a big pile of money, we bought companies, and we put them together with other companies. But I was bored. I didn't like any of the companies we were buying. We bought office products distributors, janitorial maintenance providers, and electrical contractors. It was boring, boring, boring. I met my husband when we tried to buy his company that he had started when he was 22. He was a crazy entrepreneur who believed anything was possible. He said to me, what are you doing? Why don't you start your own company doing something you love? So I took a step back and said, what do I love? That was easy, makeup and skincare products. Back in 1999, when we started Blue Mercury, you could only buy cosmetics at department stores and drug stores. There were no freestanding cosmetic stores, no Sephora's, no Mac stores, no Kiel stores. At drug stores, you couldn't try the products. There were no samples or testers. You had to buy it and hope that you liked it. At department stores, cosmetics were sold behind big glass counters with snobby staff. You would walk in. The staff would look at you and see how you were dressed and decide whether or not to help you. As a young woman in my 20s, I was intimidated shopping for cosmetics. There had to be a better way. I always loved makeup and skin care. When I grew up in California and had facials before anyone knew what facials were, I really knew that I loved the products. I went to grad school in Boston. I drove 30 minutes just to get a MAC lipstick. In Washington, D.C., there was this little beauty boutique in Georgetown called EFX. It carried a couple of interesting cosmetics brands that at that point were brand new. They had NARS, Kiehl's, and Bliss, to name a few. I loved this boutique so much, I told Barry about it. He said, why don't we buy it? All we needed was a million dollars. But I wasn't afraid to raise money. I knocked on the doors of every single person I knew, and in two weeks, we had raised a million dollars, and that was the start of Blue Mercury. Today, we have almost 40 locations, 400 employees, and we're the friendly neighborhood store for expert, honest cosmetics advice. I have a career I love. I have a terrific family. Freud once said, all you need is work and love. I have both, and I'm so lucky. However, there's a story behind it, the story of failure and hard work. So how did I get there? I have the perfect resume, right? In high school, I played varsity softball and varsity vol volleyball, was captain of the volleyball team, editor-in-chief of the yearbook, and had a 4.3 GPA. Graduated from Berkeley, got two degrees from Harvard, and I was on the cover of Inc. when I was 30. 
That's not reality. What you don't see is that all of my failures. As a freshman in high school, I didn't even make the junior varsity volleyball team. I was rejected at 10 out of the 12 colleges I applied to, and I was waitlisted at Harvard Business School. Blue Mercury almost failed four months after we started. So what's the secret? Hunger. I was hungry for success. Dreams, I always had big dreams. Work, I worked hard. And failure, when I failed, I picked myself up and got back up again. It all started with this little alligator. When I was in fourth grade, I asked my mom for an Izod colored shirt. Everyone at high school had one except for me. She said, no. They were too expensive, and why wasn't the colored shirt from J.C. Penney good enough for me? I remember throwing a fit, and she turned to me and said, when I was older, I could buy my own clothes with my own money, and that was it. Dreams. My best friend and I used to read trashy romance novels, I confess. You know, the ones about poor heroines who struggle and come from nothing, then find love and take over the world. From these, I learned that anything was possible. One of my favorites was about a poor Russian immigrant girl who eventually built her own perfume empire. I remember her first meeting to sell a perfume. She had nothing to put her concoction in that she had made in her own kitchen, so she took an old glass doorknob off a door, anybody remember glass doorknobs? <laughs> and put the perfume in that. Ultimately, she ran a global perfume company. Work, I always had a job. It started out at my father's office. He had an insurance agency and did real estate development. When I was in fifth and sixth grade, I used to file in his office during the summer. This was before computers. Everything was on paper and was handwritten. I would have stacks and stacks of papers that had to be filed alphabetically. I had to pick up a piece of paper, look at the name on it, find the letter A, open the filing cabinet, and find the right file over and over and over again. Before eighth grade, I spent the summer in LA with my grandmother and worked at a library as a library assistant, filing books and checking them in and out. This was unpaid, but I had somewhere to go every afternoon. I made new friends, and I felt important. Sophomore year of high school on Saturdays, I worked at a women's clothing boutique. I loved helping customers find the right clothes. I really loved ringing on the register. Between junior and senior year, my father hired me as a bookkeeper. This was also before computers. I had to make sure all the checks written, match the checks cashed, and total out the bank balance all by hand using this 10 key calculator that you see up there. I worked in a law firm as a paralegal between my senior year of high school and freshman year in college. And I, turned, and I worked every summer during college. My biggest learning always came from failing. When I failed, I picked myself up and went back at it. When I didn't make the volleyball team freshman year of high school, I convinced my parents to send me to UC Berkeley's training camp after school two days a week. The next year, I played junior varsity volleyball and then was pulled up to varsity that same year. I was devastated when I didn't get into a single Ivy League college after high school, but made it a goal to be a scholar at Berkeley and go to an Ivy for graduate school. I hounded Harvard Business School every day when I was on the wait list, and finally they told me to stop calling and just took me off. <laughs> because of this, I was never afraid of failure. When you want something, you figure out a way to get it. No was not an option. So what does it all mean? Here are my lessons for mothers and daughters to get to where you want to go. One, get hungry. Daughters, get hungry. Think about what you really want and find a way to get it yourself. Moms, let your daughters go hungry. If there's something they want, don't buy it for them. Let them figure out a way to earn enough money to get it. Work. Daughters, find a job. Find a job somewhere doing something. It doesn't have to be glamorous. It doesn't have to be part of a global career plan. You'll have money, you'll meet people, you'll, you'll learn to work with other people and navigate the world. Don't be afraid of menial jobs. It can lead to something else. An office or a store is a great experience. And moms, make your daughters work. Dream. Daughters, listen to your dreams. As you're reading or surfing the internet or watching TV, and you see something do, someone doing something really cool, and that voice in your head says, that's really cool. Write that down. 
Listen to them. And moms, help your daughters listen and find their dreams. Help them get closer to achieving them. Get an ATM card. Get an ATM card and be responsible with it. Convince your parents to give you a monthly entertainment and clothing allowance. Deposit your work paychecks into your bank account. And moms, help your daughters do this. In high school, I was 100% responsible for my clothes and entertainment. If I ran out of money on a monthly basis, it was too bad. Fail. Go for something that you want that you may not be able to do. Play a new sport, create some sort of internship, join a new club, knock on doors and try to raise money for something. If it doesn't work, it's okay. If you're never failing, you're not learning. And moms, let your daughters fail. And when they do, help them get back up and make a plan to succeed again. I'm already putting some of my advice back into practice. This is Arielle and Sophie at our Upper East Side store helping to clean it and open it. And this is my next project. I started relearning chemistry five years ago so that we could develop our own skincare line. It's called M61 and it'll be launching this spring. So moms and daughters, I encourage all of you to work hard, find your dreams, and most importantly, fail. Thank you. If we have time, I'm happy to take a couple of questions. So, any questions? No? Yes. Yeah, so what happened was my parents gave me a monthly allowance for clothing and entertainment, which I supplemented with a job. And I bought my own clothes, and I, um, I paid for the movies, paid for whatever I needed. Um, and that was our deal. And, you know, sometimes I would strike other deals. I would negotiate. It actually taught me negotiation skills, because if there was something I really wanted that I couldn't afford, I would make a deal to get it. And were you different than all your friends on the period? Uh, yeah, absolutely. Um, that was not the case. I remember my friends would say, oh, my parents won't give me money to go to the movies. So it was empowering because I always had the money to do what I wanted to do, but I had to make my own choices. So, uh, and I think I did, um, I did work more than my other friends, too. Um, and my parents actually didn't want me to work because they thought it would interfere with school. So it was always a little bit of a negotiation also. Anyone? Yes. Did you get your allowance no matter what? Yes, that was something that was never taken away if I um, did something wrong, which I did. Uh, <laughs> my punishment was always like I couldn't go out for the week. Um, so that was uh, being confined to the home was always my uh, punishment because um, I did do a couple of things wrong. <laughs> yes. Did you also have to work around the house and do I had regular chores. Um, I'm trying to think. I, I did have regular chores. Like uh, we traded off my sister and I clearing the table and doing dishes, um, bringing the laundry to the laundry room. So I did have regular chores. Absolutely. But you weren't penalized for the allowance if you didn't do it. No, I was just made to do the chores. <laughs> yeah. Any daughters? There's no bad questions. You know, that really came from my experiences before. So all along the path, I had met great people that were really good supporters. So I didn't talk that much about mentorship, um, but I used um, mentors. So um, I had worked in private equity and money. Um, so basically, the people I had met, I went to go ask. And it was a good time to do it. The economy was really good. It's much harder today to start a company than when I started it. Um, but you know, I was a hustler. <laughs> uh, so I hustled uh, to get what I wanted. So. Anyone else have any questions? Yes. What's it like being a female woman CEO? Um, you know, in my own company, it's great because 90% of our staff are women. Um, so I really like that. You know, you still, you have to be tough. Uh, you know, you deal with a lot of men in industry. And so I've learned how to be a good negotiator, how to stick with what I want, how to um, make good decisions. Um, but it's, you know, the, the business world is a man's world out there. Um, and so, um, 
you know, it's easy to run other fields, but, you know, you have to learn how to be tough. So I think the best skill is negotiation. Um, so, you know, that was, I think my parents taught me that by having, you know, me have my own allowance. I had to negotiate for what I wanted. So, yes? Sure. Um, well, we had raised a million dollars always with the intent of needing a couple million um, in six months. And the economy crashed. And so we couldn't raise any additional money. And so we had to figure out actually how to be profitable. Because most businesses, when they start, it takes a year or two to get profitable. Uh, and so when the economy crashed, we, we really had to figure out how to make money. Um, so it was probably, in hindsight, a good thing that happened to us because we had our eyes on the stars and not on sort of the day-to-day -day, um, really serving clients and having a business model that, that makes money. Um, so it was just a shift in the economy. A lot of businesses today, you see that again with the internet boom, you, you raise a ton of money and then you hope to make money someday. Um, so, um, but yeah, we, we just almost ran out of money. Um, so, a lesson in business, which is you have to have profit. Yes? Mm -hmm. uh, it's an interesting question, because I was trying to remember how much I got, and I didn't. Um, so, I think that it's probably enough to buy a couple things a month in terms of clothing, Go to the movie. See, I don't even know what teenagers do anymore. <laughs> Go to the movies or do what, whatever they do. A little bit for entertainment, um, and then a little bit for you know having lunch or going to Starbucks with your friends. Um, but I definitely had to supplement with work. And in fact, um, because I worked at a clothing boutique, that was strategic on my part. I got a big discount, so I ended up buying most of my clothes from the clothing boutique. I, I don't know what the answer is to that today at all. Um, but. I, I guess I'll be thinking about it in a couple of years. <laughs> no, not right now. Not, not yet. They're too, Ariel, my oldest, is eight, so not yet. Yes? When you were in college, did you have jobs? No, that was an interesting thing. Um, you know, my father had never gone to college. And he said to me, I really don't want you to work in college. So the answer is no. And that really enabled me um, to be strong in some college organizations. Um, so no, I think it shifted. And I, I think because I had done so well in high school um, and actually had gone, and Berkeley was a state school, so I'd saved my parents a lot of money by not going um, to a private school. I think that um, at that point they said, OK, um, we don't want you to work in college. Yes. Um, in terms of paying for college, I did not have to pay for college. I did not have to pay for anything in college. And my parents um, were great about that. I did pay for my own grad school. So I had hundreds of thousands of dollars of student loans um, for that. In terms of is it harder to save, um, I don't know how it's different um, today um, because you can get a job uh, during high school. I don't know if the ages have changed at what age you can work. Um, but but I, think, I think that you can always save money. You can, it's all, always, life's about choices, so you have to make a choice to save money. It's like saving on parking so I can buy earrings. Everything's a choice. You know, do I want the boots or do I want the scarf? You, you, have, to, you have to give people a reason that they can't have it all so that they have to make choices. And I think that's the most important thing, learning how to make choices. Um, I don't know if it's harder today. Um, I don't have that perspective yet. I think because I don't, I think because my daughters haven't hit the teenage years yet, um, but but I think it's still I think it's still possible. Yes. Um, do you think that going to business school made a difference in terms of giving you the skills to start your own business, or did it come from real life, your real life work? Experience? So, two things. My real life work experience was really set the foundation for me ultimately wanting to be in business because I worked at a boutique, so I knew that you had to sell things to make money and that you had bills to pay, you had rent to pay. So it just gave, it gave me very good perspective 
on what it takes to run a store. And that you, know, that you sort of build up to what does it take to run lots of stores. Um, so I think I had a really good foundation, even bookkeeping for my father. I had a really good foundation in business. And so that made me want to go into business. And that made me ultimately get jobs that helped me get to where I wanted to go. Um, going to business school helped open doors later on. Um, so it really gave me the foundation to, when I raised a million dollars, people would look at my resume and say, okay, she, she knows what she's doing. So it really gave me a foundation to get further, if that makes sense. But I, already, I always loved business. I mean, in high school, I wanted to go to business school. So that was really a dream of mine. Other questions? That was really terrific. Thank you. Thank you.